The internal combustion engine, or ICE for short, has had a long and storied history. Its origins date back to the late 19th century when the fight for dominance over machines to move us and things around included electric motors, steam engines, and of course, the horse. We all know how that story ended, with the energy density of gasoline, which is so vastly higher than that of lead acid batteries, which were the go-to high-tech batteries of the time, allowing the internal combustion engine to win out. That happened despite the gas engine's atrociously poor efficiency and the grot that it exudes because you can make up for a lot of deficiencies with raw power. But now that the EV is fighting back, will gas cars keep getting better to try and compete, or have they reached the end of their long and winding road? But first, a quick reminder to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if you're not seeing videos from us, check the YouTube video tab for the channel because we publish nearly every day. You can help us keep doing that from under one dollar a month. I'll tell you how at the end of the video. For a while, the fight between electricity and gasoline looked close. In 1899, 90% of the taxis in New York City were electric. Electric cars were clean, quiet, more reliable and much lower maintenance, just like now, and you didn't risk breaking your arm to start one up. But then the gas engine got better. It got able to go further and faster. And although it could never compete with the EV in terms of reliability, it got good enough for us to tolerate. And while most towns had power somewhere, which had been a benefit for EVs, eventually the infrastructure for gas cars became more commonplace, making the gas car quicker and easier to refuel. And the final nail in the coffin? The clean and quiet hum of the EV was relegated to being the women's car. Real men used gas for their adventures. It looked for a long time like the EV might disappear into history, partly because the gas car advanced faster, but also because every time someone tried to bring EVs back to prominence, unfortunate things happened. Like, say, the patent for a battery that was being used in EVs being bought by an oil company, who then barred anyone from making that battery for use in EVs. Weird coincidence, that. But despite being held back so dramatically over certainly the past three decades, see the fact that one 1960s EV had the same charging speed and more range than the first generation Nissan Leaf that came out more than three decades later, with EVs now being a shoe in for most purposes worldwide from 2030-ish onward, what's going to happen to the superannuated gasoline engine? In Europe, the Euro 7 engine requirements due to be introduced around 2025 are currently proposing a drop to one-tenth of current carbon monoxide emissions and a halving of nitrogen oxide, or NOx, emissions. Whether we'll also see a demand for drops in particulates, unburned hydrocarbons and volatile organic compounds, which have a mixture of negative health, environmental and climate effects, is as yet unclear. And whether those proposed regulations will make it into law is yet to be seen. But what is clear is that to meet those kinds of targets would require substantial investment in gasoline engine design and production. And so far, that's not an investment that seems to be forthcoming. Back in December, rumours surfaced that Hyundai Motor Group had, effectively, disbanded its engine development group. This was covered by multiple news organisations, us included, and the reports indicated that the Namyang Research Institute near Seoul, South Korea, where Hyundai Motor Group's engine research division was based, had been reorganised into an electrification development team and a battery development group. The internal combustion group had reportedly been disbanded and staff moved into other divisions. Hyundai North America later pushed back against these statements, stating that, quote, the group is dedicated to providing a strong portfolio of powertrains to global customers, which includes a combination of highly efficient engines and zero emissions electric motors. Perhaps given the half a million Kia and Hyundai Group ICE cars now advised to park outside because of the risk of fire, Hyundai Group might want to reconsider that reconsideration. But, What's lacking from that North American group's statement is any indication of new investment. And it isn't alone. In March last year, the chairman of the board of Audi, Marcus Duesman, stated that it is no longer developing entirely new engines and will, until it stops producing them altogether, just be updating its existing designs. 
Mercedes-Benz car's chief operating officer, Marcus Schaefer, said the same thing. And Honda? It announced last year that it will be shuttering one of its engine factories in 2025 as it shifts to clean vehicle production. And we're not done. Nissan announced in the first week of February this year that no longer was it going to develop new internal combustion engines for Europe. It was ending development for all major markets except the US where, quote, limited development will continue. And while some petrol heads are no doubt delighted that Nissan still sees some kind of a future for gas engines, I think it's important to realise that death by a thousand cuts seems to be well underway. Because it's clear from here on in, outside of some small, very high-end sports car manufacturers, gasoline engines are mostly just going to improve to meet emission standards. And doing that likely means just more and more tweaks to the software running the engines to tighten emissions controls, likely worsening the performance and the driving experience. And it's not just the engine that's only going to see small incremental changes. There's a whole lot of ancillaries that go with gas engines. CVT and manual gearboxes, alternators, fuel injection systems, exhaust systems. While these probably will continue to get some development, it's unlikely that any automaker or even any tier one part supplier is going to be hugely excited to retool and build something entirely new, knowing that it only has five to 10 years to make back the money. And that's five to 10 years on an ever decreasing segment of the market. And the bad news doesn't just stop there for gas cars. Vehicle platforms have been around for a very long time. I mean, the Citroen 2CV platform underpinned the quirky Ami 6, the super fancy Diane, and the pseudo off-road Mihari. Basically, for a while, a big chunk of Citroen's range was entirely a 2CV in disguise, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But that's to say, the concept of the platform is not new. But until fairly recently, outside of Tesla, the shift towards modular platforms had meant that EVs tended to get short shrift, with compromises favouring the less flexible gasoline variants, which needed a big space in one area for the Victorian lump dragging the car around, and away from the EV, where you could kinda hodge the EV parts in one way or another. Now, with the future looking all electric, the recent major platform releases from many manufacturers have been for EVs, leaving many ICE and multi-drivetrain platforms languishing. Sure, there are outliers, but with current and near-future legislation looking to make the gas car unsellable in several large markets, why bother hamstringing your EV to make an OK gas car and an OK EV when you could make it a really good EV and let the gas cars you have get a bit of a nip and a tuck and survive till the end of production? that expensive EV platform development doesn't translate into any benefits for gas cars. Yeah, sure, you could probably hodge a gas engine in. I mean, we've seen desperation leading to engines in Nissan Leafs, and of course Rich put an ICE V8 in a Tesla. But as battery packs become structural and the space occupied for the bits that make EVs go, like the motor and controller, get smaller and smaller, the ability to do that gets less and less, and the benefit for a manufacturer becomes basically non-existent. So sure, you might technically be able to kind of make it work, but no manufacturer will bother. The ancillaries for EVs aren't, for the most part, shared with gas cars at all. So as manufacturers play catch up to build EVs that can, and do, compete with Tesla, only the most retrograde are bothering to put much juice into the petrol engine. And while we're thinking about juice, the profit margins for the gas selling bit of gas stations are incredibly thin. All that money selling gas goes to the oil companies. Your local corner gas store in Dog River, Saskatchewan, it makes most of its money from the grocery bit. With fewer and fewer cars reliant on petroleum distillates, the ability to keep those places open is going to decrease and decrease. And the pressure on prices is going to be relentlessly upwards even discounting the ever-increasing cost of getting oil out of the ground. And the first people that's going to hit? Those least able to replace their old clunker with a shiny new EV. Oh, and since the gas engine is down, I'm gonna give it one final kick. Not a kick over, that was reserved for my old MZ, Nadenka, and its recalcitrant 125cc engine. No, just a good firm kick in the family jewels. One thing that I've seen time and time again as cars have got a 
bit long in the tooth and manufacturers have stopped making all the bits you need is the shift to pattern parts from suppliers who, how shall I say this, have more forgiving quality control standards? And I've had the joy of experiencing parts that don't fit, don't work, or are just plain shoddy for most of the older cars I've owned. And that's the future that's coming for gas cars as they get more and more niche and the profit margins get tighter and tighter. So that's it. The price gas car owners will pay won't just be at the pump. The engines will get more and more lacklustre as EV technology continues to surpass it. The ancillaries will get more and more archaic and the parts will get cheaper and nastier. The big money is going to go to EVs because long term and worldwide, that's where the market is headed. And sure, you might be able to buy a gas engine from Nissan in the US in 10 years time, but who would want to? That's it for today. Thank you for watching and we'll be back with more soon. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There's a link below. And if you haven't already, make sure that you've subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take 2, and give the bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Chris Maxwell, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tezza in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Rory Litwin, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Denny Hyde, and our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, John Lyons, Christopher Lee Jones, Laura Reynolds, Paul Conway, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. Feeling left out? You can join Patreon at the link below, hit the join button below to support us on YouTube, or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links are below. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!